going to talk about the still life and we'll begin by kind of running through what the myth of Zeuxis is. And the myth of Zeuxis is essentially um, his sort of competitor Pariasis um, was reported in the naturalist's Historia of Pliny the Elder uh, to have held a contest. And the point of which was to figure out who was the greatest ar artist. And when Zeuxis unveiled his paintings of grapes, they appeared very, very luscious and they invited all the birds down to peck at them. Zeuxis then asked Pariasis to pull aside the curtain from his painting. Pariasis then revealed that the curtain itself was the painting um, and Zeuxis was forced to concede. So Zeuxis is rumored to have said, I have deceived the birds, but Pariasis has deceived Zeuxis. And why this is important is, um, this goes back to a theorist named Jacques Lacan, who's a philosopher. And in a 1964 seminar, he said that, you know, this is a, this is revealing of something about the human state of things. Um, while animals are attracted to superficial appearances, humans are enticed by the idea of that which is hidden. So a still life, uh, in plural, it is still lifes, not still lives. It's a work of art depicting generally mostly inanimate subject matter. Uh, typically, this has traditionally been commonplace items, which have been either food, flowers, plants, rocks, shells, uh, or anything man-made, um, anything you might find in the kitchen, typically. So here we have an example of a Roman wall painting uh, done 70 AD. Um, and the Romans were actually known for you know, really good painting. The Greeks were really known for great painting, but they've since not actually survived, um, although we do know and love their statuary. Even the paint on the statuary didn't survive. And then in the bottom right, what we see is the actual myth of Zeus illustrated. Um, and you see the birds going at the painting there. And this, I think, touches on something that is uh, that I hold pretty uh, near and dear to my heart, which is the vanitas. And the vanitas was a subject of, of painting that ultimately dealt with a sort of remembrance, uh, reminding you that you do die. Um, and Peter Klaus, uh, a Dutch painter, uh, has evidence of one here. And what it means is v vanity, uh, boldface vanity, but it also means emptiness. Um, it talks about the meaninglessness of earthly life, uh, that we do go on to another afterlife, uh, and that nature is, the nature of vanity is, is really transient. It's, it's fleeting. Uh, paintings in the Vanitas style are generally to be a reminder of that, that, that pleasure is, is just temporary and that death is coming for everyone. They generally provide a moral justification for um, paintings as attractive objects too, especially during um, the Catholic Reformation. So generally you'll see a skull uh, or some sort of reminder of death. Maybe it might be an animal skull. You'll see fruit that is either rotten or about to turn. Um, so you might see a little spotting on it. Uh, you'll see bubbles sometimes, which symbolizes how quickly life can be snuffed out. You'll see sometimes smoke. Um, which can be references to the Holy Spirit, but also the fact that it's temporary. Um, watches and hourglasses, uh, which will symbolize sort of the time that you have left, the brevity of life, uh, and musical instruments sometimes, uh, or artworks. Uh, that is the sort of ephemeral nature of life in that we create these things, but we can't take them with us. So one of, a life, one of life's accomplishments or pursuits, like a book, an artwork, an instrument, um, fruit, flowers, and butterflies uh, can basically be along the same lines of how we look at the, um, the sort of turning uh, things that go bad. Um, and then the peeled lemon. Uh, generally, it was always depicted with seafood, um, always attractive to look at, but bitter to taste. So the truth. Now, this also relates to trompe l'oeil, and in class we've talked a little bit about this. This means fool, the eye, and French. Um, it's a technique in which we use very realistic or naturalistic imagery to depict um, an optical illusion uh, that generally acknowledges the two-dimensionality of the picture plane. So a really wonderful um, trompe l'oeil is this here, which is a painting of the back of a painting. Um, so it's a sort of a toying with your perception. Still life oftentimes plays with allegory. 
Um, an allegory, just sort of reference to your basic English courses, is it's a representation of an abstract or spiritual meaning through concrete or material forms. So it's symbol sometimes. Uh, it's a figurative treatment of one subject under the guise of another. It's generally a painting with a symbolic narrative. So in this painting in particular, you have the still life of the hunt, um, which is ultimately um, all that withers, all that is temporary, life. And then you have a monkey that is tied up by the waist that's still alive, trying to get to the feast, or at least trying to get away. And that is our sort of, I think, representative allegorically here as our means to, as humans, to try to escape death. So Peter Klaus, I think, is an excellent person to showcase when we're talking about this sort of meditation on the transience of life. It is ultimately objects that are basically around when things are very, very good for us, very abundant. Um, it's the, the end of a meal. Uh, things have been knocked over. Things have been left displaced and chewed on. We also see the height of the um, Dutch 17th century flower, fl floral motif. Um, the still life from the Dutch is essentially, in my opinion, the finest in Western Europe. Um, and they're, they're highly luminous, they're highly beautiful, and they all sort of meditate on the same things, using this excessive beauty and excessive wealth as a means to think about um, how the end will come for all of us. A detail of a Dahim, incredibly beautiful, incredibly layered, incredibly um, glazed. Rachel Roish, um, I think is an excellent example of a floral still life painter of the Dutch era, the golden era, which is what we call it. Um, what's interesting about flowers in the Netherlands is that the tulip essentially was evidence of their extreme wealth as a trading powerhouse in the global stratosphere. And what that, what the flor floral motif did is it showcased the availability of things that are ultimately very exotic, very expensive, and very much not lower middle class or lower class. The alternative to that would be somebody like Chardin. Um, Chardin working in the 1700s, making very sort of peasant motif still lifes of simple, humble states of being in the domestic um, theater. Uh, he also did this wonderful still life of um, his, his um, artist studio desk. And you see a little award, you see his, his, uh, his um, palette, and of course a little, a little uh, figure for him to draw and paint from, and his value scale. Uh, Zerberon, Francisco de Zerberon, was considered a very, very, very um, pious man, very Catholic in observance. And his paintings, although look very sort of benign at the beginning, were very much about his Catholic faith. Here we see lemons, which of course are a reference to the vanitas, but also a reference to the Virgin's belly. And we see that this sort of looks like pregnant forms. Another Spanish painter, Luis Melendez, and then we have fruit that has become so ripe it has exploded, um, or you know, sort of broken in half when it's fallen from the vine. Very beautiful, very meticulous. And then we have a little bit of a different turn in the 19th century with Paul Cezanne. And Paul Cezanne is considered to be the father of modernism. And as the father of modernism, he chose to break the picture plane. And what does that mean? It was more important for him to make a picture than it was a painting of a thing. So he often would break things like the perspective or make a table a little wonky or set up the table so that the table looked like it um, would allow the still life to actually slide right off. 
And this was all in the service of the greater calling that is the composition, to make a beautifully, aesthetically pleasing image rather than to render something to look like the natural world. And remember, the 19th century is when we have the rise of photography. And so the function of the painter becomes a little bit different when what we can do is rely on the photograph for those things. Towards the end of his life, um, Claude, I'm sorry, um, Manet, not Monet, um, Manet essentially was going blind due to uh, syphilis and he was pretty much bedridden. So he created these very, very beautiful, small, very direct oil paintings of still lifes from his bedside. Um, they're very humble, they're very efficient and economical in their brush making, their brush um, work, and I think that they're just very sort of stoically lovely. Someone along the same lines um, who worked, you know, more grandiose as well, was the 20th century painter Ewan Uglo. And Ewan Uglo was um, a British painter um, who really focused on the change of his still life. So you see all these little tick marks that are ultimately meant to showcase um, the changes the, through sighting and measuring of the still life as the still life might rot or, you know, sort of slump. He would do this with figures as well, which I think is really just a continuance of the remembrance of death. Giorgio Morandi was an Italian academic painter, um, academic meaning a professor, um, and sort of worked out in the middle of nowhere and worked primarily from about, you know, 25 to 30 objects his entire career. And what he would do with these very humble objects that are not um, about wealth in any way, shape, or form, he would group them together to, in order to sort of think about their positive and negative shape, but also I think it's important to note their sort of allegorical meaning as they are pushed together in groupings that could be evocative of our social lives as people. So they begin to become stand-ins for um, conversations, the way we relate to each other as we have these exchanges. And I think they're very beautiful and they very much are these sort of chalky, um, quiet, peaceful meditations on really the love of um, space and the love of form and the love of simplicity. So as we move into the 20th century and beyond, um, we move and touch into abstraction. And it literally means to draw from or separate, according to Richard Diebenkorn. In this sense, every artist is abstract. A realistic or non-objective approach makes no difference. The result is what counts. And as we know, abstraction is simply a deviation from the natural world. Um, we're making an abstraction when we essentially sit down to render a coffee cup. And how far you push that coffee cup in terms of its abstraction is really the scale that it works on. James Weeks was a part of the same school that Richard Diebenkorn was a part of. And he was um, a Bay Area figurative artist or Bay Area figurative painter in which in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, all worked in this sort of vein of semi-expressionist, um, not semi, very expressionist, um, teetering on abstraction and representation of the natural world itself. They were figurative, but they did paint like the abstract expressionists did as their counterparts in New York City, like Jackson Pollock, um, Franz Klein, etc. Wayne Thibode, or Thibode, was also a part of this group. Um, although he's considered more to be a pop artist, he painted um, lots of delectable subject matter, um, and he painted figures as well, but when he painted uh, what he's typically well known for, which is sort of baked goods and pastries and cakes, he painted them much in the same way that you would actually frost a cake. Um, and why that's important is this sort of parallel between form and function. How something is painted is touching on the what that thing actually is, which is going to lead to a much more evocative and central experience, reminding us of the actual experience of putting our finger through the frosting of cake. 
I grew up with uh, seeing this painting in the Art Institute of Chicago. I grew up about 30 miles outside of Chicago, and this painting is a very large. It's 15 or 17 feet, um, and it's a highly realist, you know, photorealist painting um, executed by a professor who teaches, I think, still at Northwestern University, James Lirio. And what we have here is a vanitas, but we have a woman sleeping, and the woman sleeping is generally the sort of new thing that's put in here. And the woman sleeping could also be um, dead. So we have a sort of more liber literal um, play here between the meditation of life and death and the abundance and shortness of how those things are really and the time that they're offered to us in blessings. James Valerio uh, uh, completes fairly large scale, very tight rendered um, paintings that are essentially about looking um, and about um, form. I think we'll end here and I'll begin in the second part.